Uh, remember, all the way back in the beginning of the semester, I introduced the concept of theory of mind. This is the capacity to impute the mental states to self and others and to predict behavior on the basis of those states. This is according to one of the, uh, the two of the earliest psychologists who, who coined this term. Uh, the anthropologist Robin Dunbar says that having a theory of mind means, means being able to understand what another individual is thinking, to ascribe beliefs, desires, fears, and hopes to someone else, and to believe that they really do experience those feelings as mental states. Now, this might seem obvious, but the opposite of this would be just to look at another person as if they were uh, a machine who just, you know, you press the right button, you'll get the right result. But people aren't like that. People are complicated. Um, you know. I might uh, have said something that someone misinterpreted, and I can't just assume, well, this is what I meant, so that, that's all that person should think. I have to realize, okay, that person doesn't know what I meant, so I have to see how did she interpret the thing I said, or how did that correspond to something I didn't know at the time that she did, that she think I meant this when I actually meant that. Uh, it, it, it's very complicated, and it's something that we have to be able to do skillfully in order just to communicate with each other, but also in order to coordinate action, to uh, be on the lookout for people who might be trying to cheat us or lie to us or something like that. Uh, but of course, to lie, you also have to, to understand theory of mind. You have to understand what people are thinking, what they know, what they don't know, what they believe, and if those beliefs are right, uh, and then you know what they'll do under certain circumstances. And uh, when we read, uh, this is something psychologists and uh, 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 social scientists like uh, David Comer Kidd and Manuel Castano have pointed out that when we read literary fiction, we develop that ability to, to use theory of mind to several levels beyond what we would need to do in order to just have a conversation or to talk about somebody who's not there. We have to understand people as they're you know, fictional people that are trying to understand other people who are trying to stand, understand other people. Uh, so. Uh, uh, literary fiction really disrupts our expectations. It doesn't go the way we typically think things ought to go, but we also have to understand how those characters understand what's happening to them and what's going on around them. Now, a scholar who has done a lot to uh, get uh, literary theorists to, uh, or literary critics to look at how theory of mind works in literature uh, is a scholar named Lisa Zunshein. And she's written a book called Why We Read Fiction that uh, tries to apply theory of mind as a, uh, a as a tool for uh, reading fiction. And she points out how well this works in, when we read uh, 19th century and 20th century novels by Jane Austen or Virginia Woolf, uh, where people are trying to understand other people and try, they're trying to understand how other people understand other people and so forth. But in order to get to this, she seems to need to dismiss the use of theory of mind in older texts, uh, in particular Beowulf. Um, and she says that, uh, it may not be possible for the Old English poem Beowulf to uh, Im embed multiple levels of intentionality, in other words, multiple levels of theory of mind. Uh, it may never be able to embed more than three levels of intentionality. Uh, in other words, that thing, you know, when I think of what somebody else is thinking, that's one level of intentionality. Uh, she says that Beowulf probably couldn't do more than three. Well, keep in mind, I first introduced this concept with Atrahasis. This is one of the oldest texts it's, it's ever written, and, and in order to understand how uh, Inki gets the gods to remove the Sarupu disease and get the gods to remove the drought. He has to get, Inki has to get Atrahasis to get uh, the, the god Adad to, uh, you know, unlock the, the bolts that are holding back the waters. And so he does that by getting the humans to make sacrifices to the gods and then withhold the sacrifices and then just give a sacrifice to Adad, who's the god who's causing the problem so that Adad feels ashamed and he feels ashamed because these people who he's persecuting uh, are still being good to him. And so he's thinking about what they're thinking, but uh, to get them to think that way, Atrahasis has to do this, but to get Atrahasis to do that, Inki has to do this. So we have at least four levels of intentionality in, the, in a 4,000 year old work of literature. Uh, but Zunshine doesn't think that uh, Beowulf can get beyond the third. Uh, and there's this instance when Freyawaru, the daughter of Hyjalak and uh, uh, Waltheo, is introduced. She's introduced at a time when uh, Beowulf has already left Hrothgar. He's left uh, Heorot. He's gone back home to the Geats, uh, to the, uh, the Geatland. He's, he's talking to Hyjalak, his king, and he's telling him what has happened. He's sort of giving him the news of, uh, well, yeah, I defeated Grendel, and I did it this way, and oh, by the way, here's what's happening in the world right now, because they don't have news, they don't have the internet, they don't have newspapers. Uh, so he is bringing news of what's going on there in the land of the Danes. And one thing that's going on is that there had been these uh, uh, wars between the Danes and the Heathabards. And the Heathabards 
live in this area along the, the coast of, of modern day Germany. So the, the Danes are up here on the island of Zealand, the Heathelbards are right here, and they've been at war with each other. Um, and to s uh, this war, they've, they've reached a truce, but like any truce, it's liable to fall apart at any time. So uh, Hrothgar gives his daughter Freyawaru in marriage to the king of the Heathelbards, Ingeld. So these are the two enemy kings, Hrothgar and Ingeld. And Hrothgar thinks, okay, we can keep this peace, make it last, if Ingeld marries my daughter and she can become a peace weaver. She can have an influence over Ingeld and make sure that Ingeld doesn't overreact to things that, that Danes and Heathobards do, uh, and so he doesn't fall back into uh, fighting. So he's, Hrothgar is thinking, I'm gonna send Freyawaru to be a peace weaver with the Heathobards. Uh, and Beowulf is explaining this to Hygelac. So uh, in uh, line 1785 to 93, uh, Hrothgar's daughter to Frodo's fair son, Ingeld, that maiden is sworn. Uh, this match seems meet to the Lord of the Shieldings uh, who looks uh, to settle his Heathobard feud. So that's what's happening in those lines. Beowulf wants Hygelac to understand that Hrothgar thinks Ingeld will feel less hostile if he marries uh, the, the Danish princess, Freyawaru, or Freyawaru could be a peace weaver. So we've got four levels of intentionality right now just in this description. Um, now it could stop there. We've got, you know, if Beowulf was as sort of simple-minded in the, the poem as he is in the movies and the TV shows, if we had like the, the action-packed, uh, you know, CGI uh, Beowulf, uh, he might say that, well, I think Hrothgar is trying to uh, set up peace, but I don't think it's going to work. I think Ingeld might change his mind. Ingeld might marry Freya Waru and he might go to war anyway. That would be an explanation, but it wouldn't be a very complex explanation. Uh, instead, what Beowulf in the poem does is uh, he says, yet despite Hrothgar's plan, the best of brides seldom has stilled the spears of slaughter so swiftly after a sovereign was stricken. Ingeld and his earls will be uh, rankled, watching that woman walk in their hall with high-born Danes doing her bidding. Her escorts will wear ancient heirlooms, Heathobard swords with braided blades, uh, weapons once wielded and lost in war, along with the lives of friends in the fray. In other words, we're not just gonna send Freya Waru when she marries Ingle by herself. She's gonna have a sort of a guard, uh, several guards, several uh, Danish warriors uh, who are gonna go with her. And those are the same, some of the same warriors who have been fighting against the Heathobards. So they're now going into enemy territory. These people who used to be fighting, now they're, they're, they have a truce. And remember, when you fight this other group and you kill somebody, you take their weapons and armor. And this was true in the Iliad, this is true in the, the Aeneid, it's true now in, uh, in Beowulf. So they're still wearing uh, those, uh, that armor. They're still carrying those weapons that they took from the dead Heathobards and now they're going into the Heathobard court. That could uh, make some people angry. And uh, specifically, Beowulf says this, eyeing the ring hilts, the, uh, the swords, an old ash warrior, ash being the wood in a spear, so this is an old spear warrior, will brood in his beer and bitterly pine for the stark reminders of men slain in strife. So you've got this one Heathobard who's watching this new Danish princess and her, her honor guard come in and they're wearing these uh, weapons that he recognizes. And he's angry and he wants to get revenge on them, but he's just an old man, uh, he can't do anything by himself. So, he will grimly begin to goad a young soldier, testing and tempting a troubled heart, his whispered words making war evil, or waking war evil. And he says, uh, the, this old Heathobard says to this young man, this young Heathobard, my friend, have you spotted the battle sword that your father bore in his final foray? Wearing his war mask, Wither Guild fell when foemen seized the field of slaughter. Uh, Wither Guild was one of these uh, Heathobards who was leading this, this charge and it was cut down. And this young man's father would have also been cut down as well. And his sword, his priceless blade became battle plunder. Today, a son of the shielding, uh, one of the Danes, who slew him struts on our floor, flaunting his trophy an heirloom that you rightly should own. And so this old man talking to this young man, pointing to this Dane who's uh, carrying this young man's father's sword. Uh, this old man will prick and peek with pointed words time after time till the challenge is taken. The maiden's attendant is murdered in turn, blade bitten to sleep in uh, his blood, forfeit his life for his father's feet. Another will run knowing the road. So on both sides, oaths will be broken and afterward Ingeld's anger will grow hotter, unchecked as he chills toward his wife. Uh, so notice what's happened here. 
uh, th th he concludes here by saying, hence I would hold the Hethelbards likely to prove unpeaceable partners for the Danes. In other words, he could just say that uh, Hrothgar is trying to set up his daughter with Ingeld so that they'll be peaceful, but I don't think it's gonna work. Uh, I mean, they've been fighting all this time with each other. Maybe they'll just start fighting again. That would be too simple. He's, he's thinking about how this uh, hypothetical uh, uh, Hethabard, this old man, is going to manipulate this other hypothetical Hethabard, this young man, whose hypothetical father was killed by the father of this hypothetical Dane who's attending uh, Freowaru. Here's our old Hethabard. Uh, he has to figure out a way to get Ingeld, the king, uh, to turn against the, the Danes so that they can kill these Danes who are now there uh, guiding Freowaru uh, into their hall. So how does he get Ingeld to turn against these Danes with whom he's got this truce? Well, he's not gonna do it directly. Uh, he's gotta get them to do something like uh, try to kill uh, one of his own Hethabards. So that means he's gotta get this young Hethabard to uh, attack uh, this Dane. And it's in particular, it's a Dane that has his father's sword. Now, the implication is, it, this isn't even maybe the Dane that killed his father, this is the son of the Dane that killed his father and has inherited this sword, but the sword came from this Hethabard who's now dead and he's the father of the young Hethabard. So notice, this old Hethabard has to keep in mind what Ingeld's thinking, what the Danes would think under a certain situation. Um, uh, to get them provoked, he has to provoke this young Hethabard and he does that by saying that this, uh, uh, this Dane with your father's sword thinks he's better than all the rest of us. Look he's, how he's strutting around the hall. So he's got to get uh, uh, the young man to think of his father, to think of the Dane who has a sword, to kill this guy, and then run so that the, the, the Danes will pursue him. And then when the Danes want justice uh, against this young Hethabard, then the Inge Hethabard king, Ingeld, is going to then turn against the Danes and then, then go back to fighting. Now, that's a lot to keep in mind. That's a lot of uh, levels of theory of mind right there. But remember, this is Beowulf trying to get Hygelac to understand that Ingeld is gonna turn against the Danes because of this old Hethabard who's doing all this. Uh, and add to that that Hrothgar doesn't see this coming. So remember, theory of mind isn't just knowing what other people know, it's knowing what they don't know. Uh, so we have to think that uh, uh, this is the kind of thing that could happen, but Hrothgar is still thinking, oh, as long as Ingeld marries my daughter, everything is gonna be fine. Uh, uh, Beowulf has to get Hygelac to bypass Hrothgar. Uh, to keep in mind, here's what Hrothgar thinks, but here's why Ingeld might think something different. He's gonna think something different because this guy is gonna get this guy to do something to this guy so that these guys will wanna kill him, uh, and then he'll turn against them, and then uh, Ingeld will turn against Hrothgar. And of course, all of this is happening in a literary text, which was written by a poet who's trying to get his readers or his uh, audience to understand that all of these things are happening. And then when we go back and read this, we know that the poet is trying to get us to think that Beowulf is trying to get Hygelac to think that the Hethabards, you know, on and on. So we're, once we factor in the, the audience and the poet, we have 10 tiers, 10 uh, uh, levels of meta-representation, uh, levels of intentionality. Uh, or levels of theory of mind here. So just because this is an old text, and just because it frequently gets the sort of the movie version portrayed Beowulf as this you know stupid jock because that's a modern stereotype and they just project that back into this uh, you know thousand year old uh, uh, text. Uh, Beowulf is not a stupid jock. Beowulf is is strong and he is someone who can kill a monster by ripping his arm off, but he's also somebody who can think ahead and who understands how other people think. And in order to understand that, we have to follow his thinking uh, as he gets Hygelac to think about how uh, King Hrothgar might not see uh, this, uh, c this discontent among the soldiers, among the Hethabards and among the Danes that could erupt. And it could erupt in this particular fashion. He sort of sets up all these dominoes and says, this is how the first domino is gonna knock down the rest of the dominoes. This is how this whole fabric of theory of mind is interlaced and you pull one thread and it's gonna pull loose everything else. Uh, so uh, this is, I, I know, an extremely difficult uh, part to sort of figure out when you're reading this, especially when you're reading it in this sort of alliteration. Uh, 
but uh, keep in mind, uh, you know, if you take the, a college class in Old English and you try to uh, learn to translate Old English, you've got to figure out, okay, what's the subject of the sentence and what's the verb? Uh, this is one of those passages that's very difficult. But it also tells us something about people at this time. Uh, theory of mind, understanding how other people uh, think, understanding how entire social groups are woven together and can be unraveled and, and, and restitched together and sometimes with, with positive or negative effect. That takes a lot of social intelligence. Uh, and this is a type of text that really does push us to try to push our own social intelligence uh, to, the, to its limits uh, a lot of times. Now I mentioned that uh, Hualfeo is trying to weave peace when she's there with Beowulf and Hrothgar, but also uh, Rothulf, uh, who is Hroth Kraki. Um, we have her trying to weave peace that the audience knows. Uh, this is an, an allusion to the fact that something bad is going to happen. So let's look back at these lines. Look at the uh, first line, 891. Many a mead cup, those masterful kinsmen, Hrothgar and Rothulf raised in the hall. All were then friends who filled Hailrot, treason and treachery not yet conceived. Well, that last line lets us know that treason and treachery will uh, at some point be conceived. There's going to be a problem between Hrothgar and Rothulf. Uh, the, the poet doesn't explain this, he just expects that we already know that. Then, wearing her circlet, Waltheo walked where uncle and nephew, Hrothgar and Rothulf, were sitting in peace, two soldiers together, each still believing the other was loyal. So again, a little bit of theory of mind, a little bit of uh, foreshadowing of something bad that's going to happen. Uh, somebody's going to t turn disloyal, and we're not even really sure who it is at this point. But each one thinks the other is loyal. Uh, we don't uh, have really an implication that uh, it's Rothulf that's gonna be the problem, or it's Rothgar that's gonna be the problem. And Hualfeo says to Hrothgar, with Rothulf right there, so everybody can hear her saying this, she's trying to act as peace weaver, she's trying to maintain this, this friendship. She says, I know that Hrothulf will honor our trust and treat these youths well, uh, her sons, uh, who stand to inherit the throne. If you have to leave this life before him, in other words, if Hrothgar dies before Hrothulf, I'm counting on Hrothulf to recall our kindness. When he was a child, and I'm counting on him to repay our children for the presents we gave and the pleasures we granted. Uh, in other words, I'm hoping he's not going to, uh, to take over the throne and uh, harm our children in order to do that. Uh, so she sees a problem coming. She's acting as a counselor, she's acting as a peace weaver, uh, she's acting as somebody who sees something that maybe even Hrothgar doesn't see the potential for. Uh, Hrothgar believes that uh, Hrothulf is, is loyal, he doesn't, uh, conceive of any treason or treachery. Waltheo does. She sees danger coming. She's trying to uh, stop that danger, hopefully before it starts. But unfortunately, uh, you know, as the poet sort of implies, the audience knows that unfortunately that's not going to work out. Something's going to happen. Uh, now, this is the same guy that is Hrolf Kraki uh, in Hrolf Saga. We know he's going to become a king over Herod or Lydar. Uh, he's going to have his champions. He's going to. Uh, you know, eventually himself be defeated. But we don't really know the difference here. We don't really know the disparity, uh, what actually happens between the two. Uh, that all is sort of lost in, uh, in, in the, the text that we've lost and we don't have to, uh, to sort of fill in those gaps. Uh, but that is our connection to, uh, between Beowulf and Hrolf Saga. That's one of these. We have this character in common. Uh, and once we've identified that similarity, we can identify some disparities for one thing, uh, Hrothgar is mentioned in Rolf Kraki's saga. His name is Hror, and he's actually king in Northumbria in uh, northern Britain. So uh, there is no treachery uh, seemingly in, in Rolf's saga, but then again, there's a lot of time and space separating Rolf's saga from Beowulf. So do they both point back to the same time period? Uh, yes, they seem to point back to the, uh, the sixth century uh, of the Common Era. Do they tell exactly the same story? Well, no, not exactly. There, there's, there are some differences here. Um, so we can't totally reconcile the two things. But we can see them as part of this larger tradition, and that's what I'm gonna talk about next time when we look at these uh, Hrolf saga, uh, Beowulf, and the other Icelandic saga that I asked you to read six chapters from, Greta's saga, uh, all of these being part of the, the bear's son tale, or at least uh, descendants of that bear's son tale.